Um, well, it really is lovely to um, be with you again this evening and to be looking at Hosea chapter 11. The prophet is about to open up a window for us into the very heart of God. And we're going to be given the privilege of gaining deeper insight into not only his heart, but into his mind. But in it, we see the wounded heart of God as he allows us to understand his responses to his people. And of course, this insight should impact not only our own understanding of God, but also of our own lives and the way that we live before him. Because like the hearers of this chapter, it should produce for us both a holy fear and reverence for God, but also become a source of hope. And I think ultimately that this chapter is also a lesson on grace. It begins with a reminder of the unique relationship that Israel has with God. It's a relationship that is that of father to son and son to father. And you can divide this chapter into three clear sections. The relationship, God's response to their sin, And then finally, God's promise of restoration. So when we're looking at this relationship of sonship, the chapter opens with the Lord declaring that it was out of Egypt that he called his son. And we need to ask the question, what is it that the Lord is challenging them to remember about their relationship with God. And what is it that they seem to have forgotten? This expression out of Egypt, I called my son, reminds us first and foremost of the exodus from Egypt and the fact that the very first time that the Lord speaks of Israel at his, as his son, is at the commissioning of Moses. When the Lord instructs him to say to Pharaoh in chapter 4, verse 22 of Exodus, you will say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord of hosts, Israel is my firstborn son. And we discover more about this relationship of sonship and fatherhood in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter one, verse 31, Moses is summing up the whole of the history of the Jewish people, getting them ready to enter the promised land. And he reminds them that in the wilderness, you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you come to this place. In both the Exodus verse and this verse from Deuteronomy chapter one, the fatherhood of God is related to God's redemptive purpose for Israel. But it also is connected to his covenant the covenant that stretches all the way back to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, that from Abraham would come a nation, a great nation, a nation ultimately that was formed in the crucible of Egypt and constituted at the foot of Sinai. As we move through Moses' summation, in Deuteronomy, he both reminds them and teaches them some important truths, vital truths that they need to remember and acknowledge them. 
So he asks them to consider a question at the very end in Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish, senseless people? Is he not your father who created you, who made you and who established you? Moses prophetically wants them to understand something from the heart of God. That without God, they wouldn't be a people. Without God, they would have remained in Egypt. And that it was God as their father who not only created them and formed them, but is the one who's established them and is about to take them in to the promised land of Canaan. But in Deuteronomy, they need to know something else about the father heart of God. And it's connected to the way that God deals with Israel as his son. It's all about discipline. Deuteronomy 8 verse 5. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord disciplines you. We reminded ourselves a few weeks ago that Hebrews 12 talks about discipline as the evidence of God's love, the evidence of our own sonship, and that ultimately it's for our good so that we would have a share in his holiness and have the peaceable fruit of righteousness. But in Proverbs, we discover something else. This is an unusual one, that discipline from the hand of God is actually a reflection of his delight in us. Proverbs 3.13 says, the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son, he delights in. Perhaps the Lord's discipline in our lives and in his children is so that his delight in them would increase. In other words, he fits us to receive his delight. The loving heart of God ultimately will always want the best for his children. And that means that If he says he loves us, he must discipline us. And ultimately, that's what the 40 years in the wilderness were, the discipline of God. But it also was about making them ready, making them fit to enter the promised land, to teach them how to live as the sons of God. You see, the Torah is not only his instruction, but it's about relationship. The law of God is not simply judicial, it's relational. And it's about teaching the people how to live as sons. This is something very fundamental to the teaching of Moses and to the heart of God. In Deuteronomy 14, verse 1, he says, a statement of fact, you are the sons of the Lord your God. Now, there are a number of scriptures that were no doubt in Hosea's mind as he opens chapter 11 with the words, out of Israel I called my son. And perhaps he had Psalm 103, verse 13 in mind as a father shows compassion to his children. So the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. It's important to understand the nature of the fatherhood of God to the children of Israel, because it's unchanging, because his character is unchanging. And what we learn about God in relation to Israel is also what we learn about God in relation to ourselves. And Isaiah reveals an incredible truth in chapter three, 43. Chapter 43 begins with 
but now says the Lord who created you, or Jacob who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. And then he goes on to explain the promises of protection. But he will also say, since you are honored and precious in my sight. You see, you are his because of his relationship with you. And in verse 6 of Isaiah 43, we have the day promised, a day that will come when God will demand the return of his children. Verse 6 of chapter 43, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. But the difficulty that Hosea has as the Lord is speaking is that the Lord is making a comparison between who Israel was, the child of his love, who Israel is, as Israel stands before the prophet, disobedient and rebellious, what God wants for this child of his. And so this chapter balances all of these thoughts. But ultimately, it's the love of God that is at stake. In Hosea, we see that this child has become rebellious and disobedient. And so the parallel of the calling of Israel out of Egypt was a call to obedience to his commandments. You see, when God calls Israel out of slavery, he calls them into obedience to himself through the giving of the Torah and, of course, the laws. And at the foot of Mount Sinai, the children of Israel willingly declare, all that the Lord has commanded, we will do. However, like us, they're not always so good at obedience. But the child of God's love is the child that God wants to train in righteousness, the child that God wants to bless. There's a similar thought in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 19, where we have the Lord speaking. I said how I would set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, a heritage most beautiful of all nations. Now listen to the heart of God as he continues. And I thought you would call me my father and that you would not turn from following me. And again, what we're listening to is the longing of the heart of God, longing for relationship with his children, longing that they would follow him and not turn away. These are the children whom God chose, whom he delivered, and whom he welcomed into covenant relationship. And as we move into verse 2, we hear his tone tinged with sadness, the deep sadness that comes from the rejection of his love, caused also by their rebellion and refusal to listen to his voice. And it's a wistful tone also in verse two. The more they were called, the more they went away. Can you hear that in God's voice? It's almost if he's saying, the more I call to them, the more they went away from me. They keep sacrificing to the Baals and offering burning offerings to the idols. 
He describes this behavior in verse seven as his people are bent on turning away from him. It's almost as if the personality of his people is twisted so that they can't walk the straight line that walking according to his laws demands. They keep veering away. It reminds me of the joke about the haggis. And the haggis, according to some, has two legs that are shorter than the other two. And it's the inside legs that are shorter than the outside. And that's so that when it walks, goes up the mountain, it won't fall over the side. But ultimately, if your legs are different length, you, you can't walk straight. And this is, in a sense, what God is saying to them. It's almost as if there's an unevenness within them that causes them to continually move away from his love and to continually close their ears to his voice. It seemed that no matter how often God sent them a word, no matter how often the prophets came and challenged them, it seems as if the more God speaks, the further they go. They continue to reject both his love and his voice. But he reveals in verse three that he was the father who carried them, the father who taught them how to walk. It seems to me that the more love the Lord showed them, the more they rejected him. Nothing seemed to be good enough. So that the people would continually choose the Baals over him. They continually chose false gods, made alliances with foreign nations. They took his blessings for granted like ungrateful children, and they failed to acknowledge from where they came, they become blind to his love. And I wondered about my own life. And I guess I posit this question not only to myself, but to all of us. How often do we fail to recognize the loving hand of God in our lives? How often have we, do we, and will we reject his voice in favor of our own selfish desires? It's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. The apostle Paul said, I, Paul, do what I, Paul, don't want to do. In other words, this internal battle leads us astray. Verse four is really interesting because in it we have a description of God that if we pair it with Psalm 32 verse nine, it will make even more sense. But first let's look at the description of God as he leads his people with tender hearted love, wooing them and drawing them on the journey from Egypt to Canaan. And he's about to describe in verse four, one of these acts that demonstrate his tender care. And it, he's described as the one in verse four who eases the yoke from their jaws and that he bent down to feed them. He's the one from heaven who humbles himself to feed them. And he's the merciful master who cares for his oxen and mules by not allowing the yoke to cut into them and to chafe them. So he lifts it. There is another explanation also that the yoke must be lifted in order for them to be able to bend down to eat the food that he has put down for them. Now, if we take that alongside Psalm 32, verse 9, the psalmist challenges the people of Israel not to be like the horse or the mule without understanding. 
which must be curbed with the bit and the bridle, or it will not stay near. For the psalmist, the bit and the bridle are something with which the owner manages to control the behavior of his animal. But the bit and the bridle was also the, the means by which the owner can direct the animal in the way that it should go. Think back to my years as a, as a teenager riding horses and just with a gentle movement of your hand on your reins, you're telling the horse to move to the right or to the left or to continue straight ahead. But the challenge is to see in it what Hosea wants the image to convey. And that is the gentle and merciful way that the Lord leads his people. It's an act of steadfast love. If we think about those reins that are being spoken of in the bit and the bridle in Psalm 32, you get the picture of the parent who's teaching the child to walk beside him. And when I was, you know, that age, it was a little harness with reins that the parent held as the, as the, the toddlers beginning to walk beside them. Today, kids have a backpack and uh, the parent attaches a lead to it and it allows that child to begin to walk independently. But it also provides the safety net. The child can't run too far ahead, lag too far behind, or accidentally fall in the path of a car. In a sense, I think this is what the Lord wants to convey. Then as he leads us, whether we're thinking about the reins and the bit and the bridle in the psalm or even the yoke on the beast of burden. The leading of God is gentle. The leading of God is merciful. And it's important to remember that this relationship of sonship is about election in God. It was the basis from which the relationship with him flowed. And it was from this covenantal election, this promise that goes all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant and stretches forward to the work of Messiah. It's out of covenant relationship that those recipients of the covenant would receive his love. They are sons by special calling. They are his firstborn. And yes, the Abrahamic covenant is the basis of this election. But it finds its fulfillment in the deliverance from Egypt in redemption. And ultimately, it will find itself fulfilled in the person of Yeshua. We see this in Matthew 2, verse 14 to 15. We read <clears throat> that he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. As we move beyond verse four, we become not only concerned with the fatherhood of God and the sonship of Israel, but we begin to have a glimpse into what the discipline of God looks like. And the exile is pictured as the discipline of God. <clears throat> 
Now, because the children of Israel have rejected God and his ways, they will have to reap the consequences. And it's because God called them out of Egypt that he will not allow them to return to Egypt. So the exile will take place in Assyria. They've lost the blessing of God and must discover for themselves what a life without God looks like. It will look different from that of pagan nations because of their status in God. And they must once again acknowledge who their God is. But it seems that the only way this can happen is if they discover the awful consequences of rejecting God. They've sought their own counsel and the counsel of foreigners and foreign gods instead of the counsel of the Lord. So the Lord threatens rejection of them and promises destruction of their towns and cities. We see that in verse six. And in verse seven, we have the ultimate warning of God's rejection. He will no longer pick them up if they fall, even if they call out to him. It's too late. They are bent on backsliding, as some of the modern translations put it, slipping back into idolatry and apostasy. The writer of the book of Hebrews warns of a similar danger in chapter 12 and verse 15. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it, many will become defiled. In Hebrews 12, there are many warnings, warnings of apostasy, warnings against failing to obtain the grace of God. The Lord was saying to them that he was going to send them back to the state in which he called them out of, and that is slavery. It's bondage. And the exile is a return to that experience to remind them where they came from and what the Lord had done them and ultimately to bring about repentance. I think there are times for all of us when the Lord looks at our backsliding and our disobedience and allows us to return to that place of bondage in order to bring us also to our knees and to repentance. And this is what's so amazing about chapter 11. The story doesn't end there. It moves on to consider the mercy, the loving kindness of God, his grace. For no matter how angry God gets with Israel, no matter how deserving his people are of discipline, of punishment and of judgment, and even though he is completely threatened to disavow them, he cannot. He cannot for a number of reasons. He must be faithful to his word. In other words, God cannot rescind his promises. But this chapter is also teaching us that ultimately his anger is greater. His love is greater than his anger. Get that round the right way, Fiona. But we also see that mercy triumphs over judgment. So he says that he cannot do what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah, to Adma and Zeboim, when he destroyed them in his anger. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 23, we read this. The whole land burned with brimstone and salt, nothing sown and nothing growing, where no plant can sprout. An overthrow like that of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, 
which the Lord overthrew in his anger and wrath. It's worth remembering the location, the geographical location of Sodom and Gomorrah. It is in that area of the Dead Sea, that land that is barren, where nothing lives. What an awful thought that Israel should experience this in spiritual terms, that their spiritual lives would be as desolate and as barren as the land around the Dead Sea. A place that looks like, according to Deuteronomy, a place that is burned with brimstone and salt. And yet, as the Lord is looking upon his people, those whom he's threatened such awful impending judgment upon, it would seem that he can't do it. He cannot destroy his people because it would cause him too much pain. His compassion is aroused and compassion flows out of his love for them. And he declares that he is God. He's not a man. In other words, he is holy. He will not come with wrath. He will not act out of pain and rejection, but will act in line with his word and his promises. And he will bring about what he has promised. He's going to make a way possible for his people to walk with him, to respond to him. He makes a similar glorious uh, promise in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17, where he says, at that time, Jerusalem will be called the throne of the Lord. All of the nations shall gather to it, to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem, and no more will they stubbornly follow their own evil hearts. And in verse 10, here in the book of Hosea chapter 11, we see what God is going to do. He says that he will roar. He's going to roar like a lion. And when he does so, his people will come trembling. As any zookeeper will tell you, there's an element of elemental fear. But when a lion roars, it gets you in the pit of your stomach. You can't really hear the roar of a lion and not be struck by its power and not feel that moment of fear. You see, God has said that he is not like mankind. You see, man is unable to hold back his anger, but God can. And what God is promising is reconciliation. And that is one, we only have to look at what's happening at the moment in uh, Russia with the Ukraine. The nations are trying to bring about peace and reconciliation. And yet, Russia stubbornly is out to restore what Russia believes Russia has lost. 
and that is territory and land. And Putin exemplifies what a man looks like who is unwilling to bend. And when we think about mankind, Guzik reminds us that man is often only willing to be reconciled if the offending party promises never to repeat that wrong. But God here is offering a, a path to reconciliation that comes even before Israel has repented. And it is an incredible promise that God is not content to simply judge human beings for their sin, but he must make a way for them. For us, that way is found in the person of his son. As I can come to an end, I see time is running away with me. This chapter reveals a tremendous truth. When man's heart is divided, it always leads to sin. But in this chapter, we see the divided heart of God. On the one hand, his anger over the sin of his people that leads to the need for judgment. And on the other, his love. When God's heart is divided, it leads to mercy. Because when his heart is divided, his mercy will triumph over his judgment. We see this in his son. The judgment for sin is death. That's what Paul says, the wages of sin is death. But because of God's love, he sends his son to bear that judgment so that we might receive mercy. And this is why this chapter ultimately is all about grace. It's about the loving kindness of God towards human beings. And it ends with a picture of tenderness in verse 11. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will settle them in their homes. Some have suggested that the trembling of these birds is because they've heard the roar of the lion. And I like the picture that they're like a dove. A dove is such a, a picture of peace. It's a picture often used to describe the Holy Spirit. Birds are timid creatures. Well, at least these birds are. We're not talking here about the hawk or the eagle or the vulture. We're talking about doves. We're talking about these little timid birds. And it ends with the reality that Ephraim, Israel, 
has responded to God's love with lies and deceit. And it's contrasted with Judah, who still walks with God and is faithful to the Holy One. Some have said that here Judah represents the remnant. Others are talking about the, the, the history of when the north split from the south and we have the northern and the southern kingdom. And initially in the southern kingdom, they continued to worship God, whereas in the northern kingdom, they moved very quickly away into sin and idolatry. However you take this verse, let's look to the heart of God in this chapter. Because it's a source of hope. You see, the relationship of child is a relationship that's meant to be a source of hope, a source of encouragement, because of all of the things that God has said throughout scripture about his relationship with Israel as a child. So I'm hoping that tonight, as we um, end this talk on Hosea chapter 11, that it gives us a little bit of insight into the heart and mind of God, how he thinks and how he responds, but also challenges us about our own walk with God and ultimately draws us closer to him, that we would not need the discipline of God. And ultimately, you see, God has given us everything we need in the person of the spirit of God to shape us, to lead us, to guide us. What more could we want or ask for? Amen.